to this week's Sunday's Digital Campus. It is so great to have you guys with us today. I'm really happy to introduce to you today, Pippa Rowney. It's so great to have you with us. Oh, thank you. It's great to be here with you all today um, on this fantastic Sunday. It is a fantastic Sunday. Pips, for those who don't know, you've either, if you've been watching for a while, you may have seen her a while back. We haven't had her with us for a little while. It was a little bit sad. She's had sabbatical and you've had a great time. Yeah. But Pips is from our Riverside campus. She is our associate pastor there with her husband, Paul. Um, and you guys do such a great job there. It's, we, we're so stoked to have you here with us as well. Thank oh, you. Oh, yeah, I know. We, we love our Riverside campus. Shout out to anyone who's watching. Hey. But yeah, it's really awesome to be um, with the digital campus again. I've missed you all as well. Thank you. One <laughs> church, many locations. Yeah. <laughs> so today we're really excited. It's week three of our series, Return of the King. Uh, it's been a really great series this, um, so far. We're talking about basically the fact that if you um, got the throne of your life, if Jesus isn't on that, someone else or something yeah. else is going to be. So it's been really great so far. Thomas is going to be up um, for this week and he will be preaching right after this clip. So I'm actually going to start today by reading to you from Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 33. And we're going to put a picture of the crucifixion on the screen. And it may be a little jarring, but uh, bear with me as I read from Mark chapter 15. It says, At noon, the sky became extremely dark. The darkness lasted three hours. At three o'clock, Jesus groaned out of the depths, crying loudly, Eloi, Eloi, lama samachthani which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, sometimes it's easy for us to forget, to forget what you went through, what you suffered for our sake. So today, Lord, help us to remember. Remember your sacrifice on the cross and also to remember that death is not the end, but rather a new beginning. Help us to remember in seasons of dying, Lord, to trust you, the God of life. Amen. Amen. I, I don't know if you've ever felt completely alone. Or, or you've been in a season of your life where you've lost all hope. Perhaps you have felt abandoned. Perhaps you've even cried out as Jesus did, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I always have to laugh when I read that statement in the original Aramaic, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Jesus is actually quoting Psalm 22 here. Uh, but it always reminds me of this Maundy Thursday s service we had with Mads, who used to head up our counseling department. And uh, she had to read that part of the passage right at the end of the service. And you know, it's a tenebrae service, so everything's dark. There's one candle left. And she had to read it out and then extinguish the last candle. And when she said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, she said, Instead of saying that, she said, Eloi, Eloi, Tina, Labaskachni. <laughs> and then she had to extinguish the candle. And of course, we're all trying not to laugh in this very somber moment. But, but, but let me get back to the actual statement, because this is actually one of the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. And it's quite profound, really. In the book, The Life of Pi by Jan Martel, he writes this. If Christ spent an anguish night in prayer, if he burst out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then surely we are also permitted doubt. And I love that because doubt is not the opposite of faith. Certainty is the opposite of faith. Doubt and faith actually go hand in hand. And as Christians, we're, we're most certainly permitted to doubt. But, he writes, we must move on. To choose doubt as a philosophy of life is akin to choosing immobility as a means of transportation. So today I want to talk about that. I want to talk about what do we do when we find ourselves in dark places, in places of pain or doubt, or we feel abandoned. And to do that, I want to look at an unlikely character in the crucifixion story. A, a, a character maybe we've overlooked before. He was a bystander to Jesus' death, someone who watched the whole thing unfold, who was there at the moment when Jesus cried out, and who in that moment had a profound awakening, a realization that changed his life forever and has the potential to change yours, to change yours and mine as well. 
So here we go. Let me read it to you again from the top, and then I'm going to read a little bit further on. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani, not lavaskachni, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled the sponge with white vinegar, wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah can, comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. And at that moment, the scriptures say, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Surely this man was the son of God. The character I want to look at is the Roman centurion. I want to kind of do a little bit of a background check on him. First of all, we know he was obviously a Roman centurion, which means he commanded over 100 soldiers in the Roman army. We know little about this particular Roman centurion except that he was probably a hardened soldier and a veteran of so many wars and conflicts during that time. He had in all likelihood presided over the crucifixion of hundreds if not thousands of men and must have at that time been pretty insensitive to sort of the agony that these crucified men would have endured. It is most likely that this centurion was present from the time Jesus was brought to Pilate right until his body was lowered from the cross and given to Joseph of Arimathea. He may have even been present with the detachment of soldiers that aided in Jesus' arrest the night before his betrayal. This man would have accompanied Jesus from the time the Jewish leaders brought him to the Praetorium. He would have ordered his men to beat Jesus, caring little for who he was, knowing him only as just another in a long line of people that he had been commanded to execute. He would have been nearby when his men dressed Jesus in a robe, pressed a crown of thorns onto his head and walked him to Golgotha. He would have been the one to give the order to proceed with the crucifixion. This Roman centurion who later became known as Longinus is mentioned in three of the four Gospels. He was the same soldier believed who pierced the side of Jesus with a lance, a lance which throughout history has become known as the Holy Lance or the Spear of Destiny. In fact, there's a whole legend around Loginus that he was actually blind and that when he, when, you know, the, when he poked Jesus and some of the Jesus' blood fell upon his eyes, he was healed. Now, now, that's just kind of a legend that doesn't really carry much historical weight. But what we do know is that this centurion, whatever his name was, had a profound transformation while witnessing the death of Jesus. And think about this. I mean, he would have seen so many crucifixions and he knew what to expect from his prisoners. Most of the men you know, that he was crucifying were criminals, brigands, thieves, murderers. He'd heard, no doubt, countless men scream in agony while being whipped and plead for their lives before Pilate. From their crosses, he'd heard them shout curses to the men below and blasphemies to the gods above. But this man, Jesus, was different. Remember I spoke of the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross? Well, this centurion would have heard them all. Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. To the people who are busy driving nails through Jesus' wrists and ankles. Today, you will be with me in paradise. To the thief who recognized Jesus' divinity in that moment. Woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. These are words Jesus spoke to the disciple John. In other words, John, take care of my mother when I'm gone. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those words of honesty and vulnerability that we looked at earlier. I thirst. And then finally, oh, not finally, the sixth one, it is finished. And I want to come back to that later. But then finally, Father, into thy hands I commit myself. Now again, you've got to understand from the centurion's perspective, these were not the words that he was used to hearing from those hanging on crosses. There was something different, something even divine about this Jesus of Nazareth. And again, this is so, so powerful. Don't miss this because in the Roman centurion's eyes, you've got to understand, Caesar was Lord. Caesar, in fact, called himself the Son of God. (laughs) And the cross was his implement of power. The cross was the convincing assertion of his authority. 
In other words, anyone mess with me, anyone try to take my power, this is what will happen to you. And so God picks that spot to reveal himself to a Roman. Jesus is the revelation of God being God. And he picks the place where the greatest human of the time, Caesar, was most feared. He chooses man's ability to kill as the place to undo that very corrupt way of being. (laughs) At the cross, the power to kill gets turned into the greatest display of God's love, of who God is. And I would suggest that this Roman centurion was not blinded by the cross, but actually saw through it to what was really going on. And it's so shocking because the the cross, like I said, would have been the last place to discover that Caesar was actually losing his power. And yet in that exact unlikely place, another power was being made known. And that's when the centurion says these profound words. Surely this man was the son of God. It's not Caesar. In fact, it's never been Caesar. Caesar is not king. Jesus is king. As you may or may not know, we're in a series called Return of the King. And we were looking each week at different characters in the scriptures who've had this encounter with God and whose entire perspective on life changes. And to be honest, this is probably my favorite story of them all because it's just so unlikely. It's so backwards. It's so upside down. The people who should have recognized Jesus, the people of Israel, didn't. And the person probably least likely to recognize him, a Roman centurion, does. All the ones who should have been in the know turned out to be in the dark. And the ones who were definitely not supposed to get it, got it. (laughs) It is God working where we don't expect him to. First, on a rugged cross where the Savior of the world dies. And second, in a Roman centurion who sees this great light. Now, you might be thinking, well, what has this got to do with me, Tom? Well, everything really. Because in this story, you know, I was thinking about it, you know, we'd like to think of ourselves as the Roman centurion in the story, like the guy who got it, who recognized Jesus. If we were there, we would have recognized Jesus. Sometimes we even like to put ourselves as Jesus in the story, like, oh, I'm suffering. I'm having a hard time. You know, I am Jesus on the cross. But if we're really honest with ourselves, we're more likely the bystanders on the sidelines. Maybe not necessarily the ones taunting and throwing insults at Jesus but rather just the ordinary people watching another crucifixion just like any other and missing out on the divine revelation right in front of our eyes. And you might ask, well, what revelation is that? Well, I'll tell you. Here it is. How we handle suffering, how we handle pain, death, hardship, reveals more about who is on the throne than anything else. How we handle suffering reveals more about who is on the throne of our lives than anything else. That's why, to be honest, I got so upset when I saw how some church leaders responded to COVID. I mean, to that suffering, you could call it, because they didn't behave well. And the watching world could see. The centurion saw the divinity of Christ because of how he overthrew Rome in power. No. The centurion saw the divinity of Christ because of how he called down the angels to take him off the cross just as the people were tempting him to. No. Because of how much influence and followers Jesus had. No. The centurion saw the divinity of Jesus Christ because of how he suffered and died. You see, the centurion would have seen over the years wannabe kings come and go. He would have seen generals and emperors and governors of Rome enter the city with all their pomp and ceremony and ego and status and wealth and power. And not once had any of those great men led him to explain, to exclaim, surely this is the son of God. And yet, and yet a carpenter from Nazareth, a Jew who prayed for those who nailed him to the cross, a man of ordinary appearance, as the scriptures say. A man whose followers at this stage, for the most part, had deserted him and run away. Somehow, somehow, through the way he suffered and died, through the things he said from the cross to those who were nailing him to it, the way he surrendered his life and gave up his spirit, something in that divine encounter led this Roman centurion to declare, surely this was the Messiah, the Son of God. 
1 Corinthians 12 verse 3 says, No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so this was indeed a divine revelation to this Roman, as it should be to us as well. You see, here's what gets tough. We want people to see the glory of God through our greatness. But the glory of God is revealed through our weakness. Hello? I mean, we want, to, we want people to see the glory of God through our achievements and our accomplishments and our successes. But the scriptures declare the opposite is true. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. In weakness. My power is made perfect through weakness. That, that's actually the title of my message today, Power Made Perfect. <laughs> now, now, why is that? Well, because our weaknesses make us depend on God and draw us close to Him. When we're strong, the reality is we don't need God. <laughs> or God becomes an accessory to our lives. When we're strong, we believe the lie that we are the ones responsible for our own success. We are the ones you know, who made it happen. We're the ones on the throne. We're in charge. But we are not the king. He is. And the throne belongs to him. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul goes on to say, he says, So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. For when I am weak, the, the Greek word here is feeble. Uh, he says, when I'm feeble, when I'm impotent, then I'm strong. The Greek word he, for strong here is donatos. It's a great word. It means powerful. It means capable. It means able to do all things. How? Through Christ who gives me strength. Not my own strength, not my own smarts, not my own achievements. Christ's achievement, Christ's strength, Christ, what he did for us on the cross. Okay, so how do we actually kind of make this truth a reality? How do we, we, grab, how, how do we grab hold of that? How do we, like the Roman centurions, see the truth? The truth that how we handle our suffering and our hardship actually reveals more about who's on the throne of our lives than anything else. Well, today I want to leave you with three things to stop doing today that I think can help. And that in the end, I think will actually help others to see God's power, Christ in us. Others to see his power made perfect through our weakness. So I hope you're ready. The first is this. Stop posturing. Stop posturing. Posturing is defined as behavior or speech that is intended to impress, attract attention and interest, or to make people believe something that is not true, like I'm more important than I am, or whatever. And it's almost always a mask. It's, it's, a high, it's a masking of something, usually fear. Fear of being found out, fear of not being enough, fear that people won't like you, or maybe they'll leave you if they really knew who you were. Posturing is a cover-up for our insecurity. And it presents in all kinds of weird and wonderful ways. When we meet people for the first time, you know, we're trying to impress when we keep talking about ourselves or we keep talking over others, uh, when we get jealous over someone else's success, or maybe we get defensive when someone points out a flaw or weakness. Basically, when we present a version of ourselves that is not congruent with who we really are. And we can do that in li real life and we do it on social media all the time. My wife, Jess, who I'm sure you've seen preaching if you've watched before, uh, she, she's fast becoming a social influencer. Um, she wrote a book and it's kind of doing well. And now she's getting invited to all these fancy sort of influencer galas and dinners and stuff. And, uh, and we went to a premiere the other night and the whole night I was being introduced as, this is Tom, he's Jess Besson's husband. <laughs> uh, the glove fits, you know. But, but honestly, and, and, and I say this with respect, some of those women, I mean, they're, they're so dressed up, they're so dolled up, they're so make up up they they so, I mean, I don't know how else to say this nicely, but like there's been injections. and Anyway, <laughs> but honestly, when I look at their eyes, when I look in their eyes, I, they just look tired beneath all of that veneer. They look exhausted, in fact. Because the problem with this kind of posturing is it creates a gap between the public you and the private you. A fracture that becomes harder and harder to maintain and more and more exhausting to keep up. 
And honestly, I think it's why so many leaders fall and fail, Christian leaders included, because somewhere along the line, the gap between their private persona and their public persona, it just grows too big. And who they are when no one's looking is not the same as who they are on stage or in the boardroom or in front of a camera. And it almost always leads to a, a fracturing and an eventual breakdown if it's not kept in check. Now, please hear me. I'm not saying don't wear makeup or, you know, don't, you know, or that we need to air our dirty laundry with everyone we meet. I'm not talking about that. I do think it's possible to be too vulnerable with people, uh, especially if you're in sort of a leadership position publicly. But at the very least, we all need people in our lives who we can be 100% honest and vulnerable with. People who know all our dirty secrets and who love us anyway. People who are willing to speak the truth to us and call us on our own stuff. You know, for the Roman centurion, think about this. Declaring Jesus was the Son of God meant he had to seriously lay down his public persona. I mean, this guy was a Roman captain. He was the commander of over a hundred soldiers in the Roman army. The Roman army that declared Caesar is Lord and that were willing to go to war and die for that declaration. And Roman soldiers, they wore sophisticated armor. It's called the res militaris. And in a sense, to declare Jesus was Lord meant for the Roman, he would have to stop posturing and remove the mask. In this case, the armor that was basically a representation of his rank and his station and his title. <laughs> and so I guess that's the challenge to you today. If you want to put Christ back on the throne of your life, then stop posturing. Take off the mask. Take off the armor. It's so heavy anyway. Those items of clothing or maybe those defense mechanisms, even weapons that you've used to protect yourself or hide behind for years. Those lies you've believed or told others. Those excuses you've made, the stories you tell your, to, to make yourself appear more important, more accomplished. Just take it all off, as Paul writes, that which hinders you. Come clean, be honest, be vulnerable, get help. I mean, if you're going to wear armor, rather put the armor of, on the armor of God, a helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, not yours, Christ, the shield of faith, the belt of truth, shoes of peace, and of course, the sword. Of God's word. It's a different kind of armor. That's point one. Stop posturing. Second point. Stop attaching your identity to your performance. This kind of goes hand in hand with point one, but man, this is a big one. And to be honest, this is a tough one for me. This is something I still struggle with. Because for so many years, and certainly growing up, I've completely attached my identity to my performance. When I was growing up as a, you know, a competitive gymnast, my performance in, in gymnastics, my performance at school. And in many ways, it was great because I was successful and I was smart and I was a straight A student and all that. The problem comes when that stuff goes away. An injury that prevents you from competing or a bad grade or getting to varsity and realizing you're not as smart as you thought you were. And then suddenly everything comes crumbling down or you begin to compromise your values and your morals to keep up the act. Why? Because you've attached your entire sense of self, your entire worth to what you do or how well you do. I think it's why so many older men struggle with retirement because they've attached their identity to their job title. And when that job title is no longer, they no longer know what to do or how to be. And let me tell you, let me just save you the trouble. No amount of success or status or money, or anything in this world has the capacity to hold the weight of your worth. Because you are infinitely and eternally worthy. You are a child of God. You're created in His image. So nothing finite in this world could ever be enough to fill that void in your heart. Only God can do that. You are worthy because you are His child. Full stop. Nothing you do or don't do can make God love you less or make Him love you more. You are loved. That's it. So stop attaching your identity to your performance, to your job title, to that number on your payslip, to how hot the guy is you're dating, to your success or your failures. Oh, the team like that one. Um, to, you know, you're more than what you do or where you've been. And, you, and here's the crazy thing. You know what happens when you let go of that? What I've found is that actually your levels of success and performance actually increase dramatically because you're no longer insecure about it. 
You have a confidence in you that goes beyond whether you win or lose, whether you get the job or not, whether people like you or not. And I think people can feel that. They can sense that in you and it's attractive, it's magnetic. So you end up attracting more success. And it's great because then success at this stage, it just feels like an added bonus rather than the goal itself. Stop posturing. Stop attaching your identity to a performance. And then finally, stop equating worldly blessing with godly provision. Guys, this is huge. Especially if you grew up in church or you have maybe a, a more conservative church background. This is so ingrained in our religious thinking that successful people are blessed and blessed people are successful. I saw a post the other day uh, from a church leader and, and it said something like, if God's hand is on any area of your life, then it won't shrink, it will thrive, you know. <laughs> and on one hand, I know what he means and, and there's a partial truth to it. I do believe God wants to bless your life. I do believe God is in the business of human flourishing. I do believe that if something is spiritually healthy, it will grow. I mean, if a baby is not growing, we take it to the doctor. It's called failure to thrive, FTT. But at the same time, just because something's growing doesn't mean it's healthy. Cancerous cells growing, a tumor growing is not a sign of health. It's a sign of unhealth. So if it's healthy, it will grow. But if it's growing, it doesn't mean it's always healthy. Does that make sense? I mean, I've seen churches grow off the back of someone's pathology, their ego, their dogmatism. And it always, always comes crashing down by the grace of God. And so stop equating worldly blessing with godly provision. I mean, the disciples, think about this. We're all martyred. All except one. Many of them were beheaded. They were persecuted, sidelined, cut down, forgotten, murdered. They were called liars, traitors, fools. They were not rich. They did not amass fame and fortune in their lifetime. Now, does that mean God was not with them? Does that mean God's hand was not on their life? Of course not. One of my favorite verses in all of Scripture is Acts 4 verse 13. And it says this, When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. These men had been with Jesus. That is what astonished the world. Not Peter and John's smarts or knowledge. It actually says that they could see these guys were unschooled, ordinary men. And if you do a word search on that, the word for unschooled, the actual translation in the Greek is idiotes. It's where we get the word idiot from. <laughs> An honest modern day translation is they could see these guys were a bunch of idiots. But they were astonished because they had been with Jesus. And that gave them, them a courage. It was not their greatness that revealed the glory of God. It was their weakness. Power made perfect through weakness. I hope you're getting this. Stop posturing. You don't have to prove yourself to anyone. You're loved by the king. Stop attaching your identity to your performance. You are his child. He delights in you already regardless of how you perform. And stop equating worldly blessing with godly provision. Just because God isn't filling your bank account or opening doors or delivering you from hardship doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. God's blessings are not always the same as the world's blessings. And anyway, our inheritance is not of this world. It is a different kind of inheritance and a different kind of kingdom. Now, now let me close today by going back to the story, the story of Jesus on the cross and a Roman centurion watching from below. And uh, I only saw this this week, that, 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 that there was actually something else about the way Jesus died that convinced the Roman centurion that his enemies were wrong and that this man truly was the son of God. And it's found in verse 37 and 39. So you kind of, kind of got to listen carefully. Verse 37, it says, And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. And then in verse 39, it says, And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up his spirit, he said, Truly, this man was the son of God. Now the question is, why would Jesus' loud voice, his cry, cause the centurion to say this was the Son of God? Well, this intrigued me and what I discovered in my research is that 
The loud cry of Jesus is a very unusual thing because men who were crucified usually had no strength left, especially when near death. In fact, they had very little air left in their lungs at all because they would drown in their own fluids. But Jesus' death was no ordinary one, nor was his shout the last gasp of a dying man. It was actually a shout of victory. It was a shout of victory. Just before his final shout, we know he shouted, it is finished. Some believe this shout and this final shout were actually the same shout. And when he said it is finished, when he shouted, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. This means it's a representation that the old covenant, the old way of approaching God, where only the priests could go behind the curtain in the temple, only the select few had access to God. Now all of that was done. The old covenant was completed, fulfilled, over, finished. Jesus had made a new way. And now everyone, everyone has access to the Father through the Son. Now everyone can approach the throne of God because of what Jesus has done. It is finished. No more sacrifices. No more striving for perfection. No more religion. Now grace, grace, grace paid it for four in full. Unachievable, only receivable by faith. Remember, the centurion had seen it all. At the beginning of this crucifixion, he was an unbeliever. But he heard Jesus pray for him, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He saw the darkness fall over the face of the earth. He saw the earthquake. And now he saw Jesus die as he had never seen any other crucified man die. All the others became, that came before were so weak they couldn't breathe and they died in silence. But Jesus cried with a loud voice. It was no ordinary cry. It was a victory cry. And it's a cry over you and me. And so today, if you're watching this, if you feel abandoned, if you too have ever thought, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you find yourself in pain or doubt, suffering, out of breath, know this, God is declaring life over you. It is finished. It is done. I have made a way and I am the true King. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this truth that you are the King. Written above your cross, it said the King of the Jews. And though it was written as a mockery, we know actually it is the truth. You are the King. We thank you for the return of the King into our own lives. Help us to stop posturing. Help us to stop attaching our identity to our performance, Lord. Help us to trust in you. Thank you, Lord, that we can do this because of who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come
heard your children and you hear your children now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You answered prayers back then and you will answer now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You were providing. Sure, what a great message from Tom today, Pips. Yeah, it was beautiful. Really just sat with us and with me, particularly, you know, the fact that he said that God's power is made perfect in our weakness, which is which is straight from scripture, but that we don't have to prove ourselves to anyone, that we are already God's child and that we are already loved as we are. And that just, that really sat with me and um, I'm sure there's things that sat with you as well. And why don't you let us know in the comments, let our mm -hmm. hosts know. Um, if you'd like to drop us an email during the week, if you need prayer for anything, please do so. We would love to be able to interact with you in that way. Know how the message has impacted yeah. you. Know how we can pray for you going forward as well. Mm. Um, but being loved by God, just I, I want to really leave that with you guys today. Mm, and I love that idea. Um, for me, it's it's so helpful in in understanding God's love for me mm. um, to take that out into the rest of my day to day. Yeah. And um, so as we go into a time of giving now. Um, this idea of, of being loved by God is, is um, almost like the catalyst towards our giving. Mm. And so if you do give in this moment, the details will be on your screen below. Um, if you are new, please don't feel any pressure to have to give. Giving is an opportunity for us as, as the church to, to trust in what God is going to do. Mm. And because He loved us first, yeah. out of that space we give. Yeah. And so I'd love to pray for this mm. offering. That'd be great. Um, so yeah, let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful that 
you invite us into your story. Mm. Um, and it is a story that is generous, God. And I pray that out of the understanding that um, you love us so much, God, and that you meet us where we're at, Father, that, God, we would take what we have and we would give it back for you to use in this world. Yeah. Jesus, we thank you for that privilege. Yeah. Amen. 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 Thanks, Pips. Mm. So we've got something coming up, and I'm sure you've heard about it a little bit on social media, or maybe we've mentioned it if you've been watching as well, um, that we've got GLS, which is the Global Leadership Summit, and that is coming up in person at our Schlanger campus in KZN on the 14th and 15th of October. That's a Friday and a Saturday. And online, it's going to be happening as well next month, November. So make sure you check out um, what days those work for you as well you can buy tickets um, from our grace website it'll take you through to Quickets. Um, it's just a lot easier to go straight to our yeah. website than to try and it type is. a whole long url and <laughs> um, we'd love to have you there it's just basically a time of inspiration we believe that everyone has leadership yep. and we want to basically envision your vision we want to help you voice your vision for this new season that you're going into and so i really encourage you guys to get involved with gls yeah, I love GLS. It's one of the highlights of my year. I'm so totally. excited that we're meeting in person. Yes. Um, but it's also one of those things that's not just about a Sunday. Yeah. And and I think that's one of our things here at Grace. Totally. Um, church is more than a Sunday. And so if you are part of our digital campus, make sure that you are connecting online on a Thursday. We mm. have 10 with Tom Very cool. each week, which is always such a great um, insert into your week. It is. Uh, we also uh, released a new podcast episode last mm. week. So go to um, our YouTube channel to find that. Yep. And even more exciting, we have updated our worship playlist. Yeah. I know that so many people ask for what songs were sung on a Sunday. Yep. And our worship playlist is an awesome place for you to uh, be encouraged and inspired by some of the music that we're singing. Exactly. It's so nice to also have in the background. I love playing worship yeah, music while too. I'm washing the dishes and like doing general stuff around the house. Me so too. now it's like involving in church as well as yeah. listening to worship while Absolutely. you're doing everyday things. So, so great. don't forget to check that out. It'll be really cool. Yeah. And please also like and subscribe to our pages on Facebook, on YouTube, on Instagram, we even on TikTok. Can you Ooh. believe it? I know. We're trying to <laughs> keep so it brave. Brave. <laughs> <laughs> So we would love you guys just to, to subscribe. We'd love to just see how our message goes out there. We've got over three and a half thousand subscribers sure. on YouTube. Yeah. So it's been so great to see how our community is growing. Don't forget that also you can share this message on whatever platform you're following on. If this has impacted you today, we'd yeah. love to know who and, and how far this goes to what family members, what friends, you know, what mm. colleagues need to hear today's message about God loving them just as they are, that they're not having to prove themselves. Share yeah. this with those people who you know need to see this message today. That's amazing. Yeah. Love That's it. awesome, hey? <laughs> <laughs> so it's been so great to have you all with us today. Thank you so much for joining. Pips, it's been so great to have you. Thanks for having me. Hopefully it won't be so long next time. I know, come back. I know. I'll be back soon. <laughs> awesome, I love it. And um, we hope to see you on Thursday for 10 with Tom. Otherwise, next week, Sunday. Cheers, everyone. Bye.